Cool. Well, my name's Mark, and I've been functional programming for far too long. Um, that's, that's my ethos. So I've been doing for too long, and I need to look back at all of the problems and all of the mistakes that I've made, um, the bad code bases I've created, and, and try to look, at, look for some lessons to take away and things that I wish I knew 10 or 15 years ago. So that's kind of the point of this talk. It's a bit of a reflection, uh, a reflection on things that I've done in the past and some takeaways for me for it, but also a reflection on uh, functional programming in general and, and where it started and where it come from and, and just a couple of lessons or ideas for people to take away and maybe uh, use in their own code bases, use in their own projects, use in their own systems. So the place I want to start is to talk about complexity uh, the programmer's obsession with complexity. What is complex? What isn't? Uh, is it essential complexity? Is it accidental complexity? Uh, how do we tame complexity? And the place for me to start with this is in 1986. So uh, this isn't the first time that complexity was used for a proxy in the challenges uh, for complexity uh, for software, challenges in building software, but it's the one that was probably the clearest and has the most lasting uh, impact on our industry. Brooks published his paper, No Silver Bullet, uh, Essence and Accidental uh, Complexity in Software Engineering. Um, and he introduced four inherent properties that make programming hard and claims that these will always make programming hard. These aren't challenges to be solved. These are the things that we have to fight against. The first one's complexity. That is how systems interact with each other. It's not so much the number of things that are going on in our system, but how they interact and, and how they interact over time. Conformity, the fact that we have to conform to uh, the past, the fact that we have to conform to other systems. Uh, we're not just building software in isolation, we're building software to work with other systems, systems that may have been built 30 years ago that may be poor, may be broken in all sorts of ways. This whole idea of changeability, software isn't static. We're always going to be adapting and changing into new requirements, building on top of it. And invisibility, this idea that, that it's very hard for us to see code at a higher level. Uh, we see this playing out in many uh, operate, uh, DevOps organizations at the moment. They have this idea of observability, trying to understand what your infrastructure is doing at a higher level without having to look at the code, um, kind of the uh, see what's going on rather than having to go through every line of code because there's just too much of it. Moving on to 1990, uh, John Hughes published his paper, Why Functional Programming Matters. And when I reread Silver, uh, Brooks's Silver Bullet paper, uh, this is the thing that comes to mind now, is that functional programming is a way to deal with complexity. It's compositional programming. It's changeable. It's adaptable. It lets us deal with many of these problems. Keep going on this theme. In 2006, Mosley and Marx published their paper, a uh, paper which is probably the most influential into how I design software. He pub they published this paper called Out of the Tar Pit. Basically, embracing and taking aims at, aim at the silver bullet paper, saying that complexity is the root of all programming challenges. And functional programming is one of the key aspects, and compositional programming is one of the key aspects of pulling, it out of, pulling us out of it. Uh, they state, they talk about state and control and ordering in programs as being the biggest challenges to complexity. And to kind of finish off about our kind of tour of complexity and people talking about complexity. In 2011, uh, Rich Hickey uh, gave this talk, Simple Made Easy. He, and it's probably one of the better talks on complexity. Uh, and it's probably one of the most referred to talks over the last 10 years. He talks about the fact that simple things are not easy to do. Um, if we want to fight complexity, we have to work really hard to do it. We have to find techniques that help us uh, achieve our goals. We don't get simplicity just through doing the easy thing or doing the thing that takes the, the path of least resistance. So the goal of just showing these little tidbits of, of people talking about complexity is that this has been going on for a long time. This is the last 30 years of people talking about complexity and talking about potentially how functional programming can give us some levers to uh, improve on, on how we build systems such that the, the, the complexity is more manageable. Uh, and and it, it's a lot of the things I think about when I'm trying to build good software. What makes programming hard? Like the essential complexity in the problems, having to deal with the rest of the world. Um, getting it right once isn't enough. We have to get it right this time, and when we make a change, we have to get that right, and we have to keep getting it right. 
In order to do this, we have to control state in our programs, we have to control the ordering of our programs, we have to control changes, and we have to work really hard to do it. Uh, we can't leap to the familiar, we have to work hard if we really want to achieve, achieve simplicity. So what, what is missing in these, these uh, discussions of complexity is how do we actually go about addressing complexity in systems? And it took me a long time to understand this and a long time to actually find examples of, of people going, well, actually, this is how I program to kind of fight this complexity. And in retrospect, um, I had actually been doing it for quite a while before I understood it. So I'm going to go way back in time, 1948, so 60 years ago. Um, in 1948, we were presented with typesetting problems that we haven't been able to fix yet. So I'm not sure if you can see the title there. Um, but John von Neumann uh, presented this paper, The General and Logical Theory of Automata. And he talked about, um, talked about AI, talked about, well, before AI, the term AI was invented, he talked about machines working like living organisms to make smarter decisions, about programs learning behaviors. And in his audience that day was a person named John McCarthy. And John McCarthy went on to coin the term AI, coin, um, uh, build the first machine uh, learning labs, mm -hmm. and to found functional programming. From 1958 to 1963, McCarthy introduced us to what is symbolic programming and functional programming it in the way that we think about it now. So in 1956, McCarthy and Marvin Minsky held the first AI, uh, AI uh, summit where they got a group of people together like this and they went and they said, well, what are the problems? What is actually AI? What are the problems that we face? What do we have to solve in order to kind of reach that goal? And as a part of that, someone introduced him to this idea of symbolic programming and list processing. In 1959, he then went on to outline ideas of what he, a program or what he called the advice taker, this idea of programs with common sense. We were gonna teach programs. And in order to teach programs, they had to know or understand the real world. So they had to be able to understand declarative facts about this world. And the challenge here was that he didn't have any programming languages that he thought were adequate to be able to express the complexities of dealing with a program like this. A program that had to deduce facts, had to understand time and understand changes over time. And he, he, he articulated that we need a higher level programming environment about two years later, in 1960, he released what is now called Lisp, the first functional programming language as we program today. And the whole idea of Lisp was just to enable him to solve problems that were very challenging and very complex. And so functional programming's origins are about addressing this complexity, and specifically about addressing complexity with regards to understanding things over time. McCarthy went on to uh, publish his paper, Situation, Actions, and Causal Laws, which gives us a language for discussing actions over time. And I'm gonna use this uh, a few times, so I'll just go through a few, few examples. He has this kind of grammar that kind of derives causal inference. So a simple idea is like, I am at my desk, my desk is at my home, therefore I am at home, right? It's like pretty logical uh, deduction. However, getting a program to learn this uh, was quite challenging. So one of their first goals was the idea of uh, trying to teach a, check a computer program to play checkers without it actually knowing how to play checkers. It just knew the rules of the game. And this probably feels pretty similar to what goes on in the modern world. We have Google um, trying to beat Chess Engine and trying to beat Go and a whole bunch of other things. We're still trying to do this, solve this same problem 60 years later. So what was his big idea? The big idea is that uh, we can re if we can reason about all the previous states of a system, so if we can reason about what's gone on in the world in the past, I, I had put my desk in my home, I am now at my desk, now I can deduce new facts. If, he figured that if he could understand every previous state and how we arrived at each state, then he could tackle uh, complexity in, in, in the domain of whatever challenge he was trying to address. So that's probably the past, looking at the past. I want to go on and now talk about kind of how that's influenced 
uh, systems that get built today and how uh, it's influenced systems that I've built. And kind of talking about this idea of factual data. So facts in real life, so fact-based systems. So when we're dealing with data and programs, uh, we have a whole bunch of problems that, that are traditionally faced. This idea of statefulness. Uh, so data in programs is often tied to some particular state. We have to know a whole bunch of other context about it is that we have to talk to the system at a specific time to get the right value or we have to understand how it arrived at that value. Data is often non-repeatable. If I go and ask a system for an answer and I get this result, I can't just say, oh, go and ask that same question and trust that you'll get the same answer. Often we'll get different answers or conflicting answers. I can't go and ask the same question multiple times and expect to get the same result. Um, this is pretty problematic. In the programming domain, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, is like we have dependency management. I go and ask for my dependencies. What are the best dependencies for this project? I want to get the same answer every time. I don't want to get a different answer depending on the day of the week. Data is traditionally non-distributable, non-transferable. So I can't just share data with you and expect it to stay in sync. Uh, we have all sorts of coordination problems that we have to solve. We have questionable update semantics and data loss. So we often update data in a way that um, if we update data, we lose. So I used to live in Brisbane. I moved to Sydney. And in most databases, it's just going to say, I live in Sydney now. Has no concept of where I used to be, when I moved, and a whole bunch of other things. So we lose data when we update things. Most data systems make experimentation uh, very difficult. I don't get to ask what if questions. Okay, what if this happened? What would have the answer been if I hadn't moved to Brisbane? What if the, what what other scenarios could have been happened? Normally I have to commit and say, well, this is now my data and now run the query. Um, so that's pretty inflexible. And I don't get to introspect on the data very often. I don't get to ask, well, how did this data get to my system? How did it change? When did I move? The fact that I was in Brisbane, then I was in Sydney, when did I actually transfer? So to address these, I want to talk about this idea of facts and values. Values are this idea of immutable, transferable, context-free pieces of data. So the number seven. If I have a number seven and you have a number seven, we're talking about the same thing, right? But this can apply to all sorts of data. So I play a lot of online chess. And when I'm communicating with somebody about a game of chess, I don't say, oh, here's a link to a game and then hope that they get to the same place and that it hasn't changed or anything. I can copy that whole game as a value. So there's a notation for a chess game to be encoded as a value. And I can pass it to them. And they have the value and I have the value. And nothing's ever going to change that. They're transferable. They're context-free. It is that game. Uh, there are lots of other examples of this. And I'll talk a few more uh, maybe later on uh, in Git and a few other places where like, a file, the contents of a file, is a value. Like, it is what it is. If I have that file and you have the file, we have the same thing and they're not going to change. Extending this idea is this idea of facts. And it's a claim that this value is associated with somebody or something at a particular time. So uh, back to my city example, I live in Sydney, and I lived in Sydney in 2018. Um, that's a fact about me and about the object Sydney. Facts are deterministic. They don't depend on when they were queried. When I say I lived in Sydney in 2018, that's true now. It's going to be true in 10 years. It's going to be true in 20 years. I still lived in Sydney in 2018. Comparatively with uh, traditional data store where I'd say, I currently live in Sydney. In six months' time, that may not be true. And putting these together, we have this idea of fact-based systems. Systems that accumulate and coordinate facts in a way that uh, let us add to our knowledge over time and let us query those in a predictable and meaningful way. So I want to talk about a system that I spent a long time building and thinking about that was a fact-based system to kind of uh, reinforce what this idea of a fact-based system and controlling time in data is all about. So I was basically obsessed with the dependency management problem. I was sick of getting a check out of a project and then going, build, and it broke because the dependencies weren't up to date or they, never, they, they had changed and things were out of sync. Right? This was a fair while ago. 
um, before most uh, dependency managers had lock files and the, the internet moved on and somebody deleted a file and things didn't work anymore. And I really wanted to fix it. And I really don't like semantic versioning. Because for me, semantic versioning has this problem is that it records a static piece of information at a specific point in time. And dependencies are far more than that static point in time. When I make a commit to a piece of code, it's not static, it's not one point in time. It's gonna go through a series of projects. It might go through a CI build, I might publish it, and that's when I put my version number on it. But after that, it's gonna go and get a platform test. It's gonna to go to production. In production, I'm gonna get some performance numbers. These are all pieces of information that I wanna have about this dependency. I don't stop as soon as I commit my code, or I don't stop as soon as I publish the artifact. I actually want to understand the full timeline of any dependency. And it might be a long time, five years later, or three years later, or two days later, and other events might happen that affect this dependency. It might get a CVE, a vulnerability recorded against it. And I might want to know that. So how would this work, building a dependency management system around facts and around facts? So here's a simple dependency graph. So uh, simple projects that uh, I used to have in my own company. So um, the polling depends on Boxer and Snowball, and there's, there's a few graphs here. So what does a fact-based system around recording information about these dependencies look like? So we have this idea of a family or an identity, something that we're describing. So Boxer is a dependency or a set of versions uh, that we want to talk about. So they have IDs. And then there's a specific instance of that. So a specific distributable or a specific thing that I can install and run of Boxer. And it's called an atom. Atoms have an ID. And then we want to start storing facts about those atoms. So a fact might be about a build might be it includes this commit ID, or it might include these 50 commits. It has this API signature. So what is the actual API signature? So I can ask a question like, is this binary compatible with this other version, or is this source compatible? It might be a simple thing like it contains, a fact might be it contains this feature. So I know that I really need the X feature in production. Does this version include it? And we take these facts and we attribute them to our atoms. So we'll go along and say that Boxer 1.21 has all of these commits in it, has this API signature, and it has this feature in it. And then we take all of these facts and we put them into a world. So basically, all of our families against all of our facts. And so we store everything that's ever happened against any dependency in our system. So we know what the performance numbers were against the last version, what the performance numbers were against this version, so we can compare them. We can start to write interesting queries over all of these facts. And we don't have to think about those things uh, up front because we have all of the information. We can come back and understand the system later on. These worlds change over time. So at one point in time, I only knew the commit, the API signature, and the feature. The next one, I might say, I've tested on this platform. I know that it definitely worked here. And so I can say, well, here's a new version of my world that's got more facts in it. And I could query against either of those. I could say, well, what did it used to look like? What does it look like now? And then we can tie other artifacts to it. So I actually went and stored this. And this comes back to the value semantics that I was talking about earlier. I can say that this artifact is actually stored here and has this address. And I can store this in, uh, I'll explain a bit more, content addressable storage. So I can go and put it in a data file. And it doesn't matter if I have several builds that all look like the same. They'll all point to that same spot. And if we have a copy of that build, and you have a copy of that build, then I don't need to send it to you. It gives us this kind of free predictable caching because we know they're identical. We can then start to write interesting queries. So instead of having a con version constraint where we say, I depend on version 1.21, we can start to make more interesting queries to say, what are my dependencies? I might say that I definitely need this feature, or I definitely need this commit. Uh, I might say, I want my dependency to be compatible with each other. Um, I want to actually check their compatibility API. Or more traditionally, I could say, I want the semantic versions. But we also want to have a first class notion of time. So. Uh, who uses a uh, programming language that has a dependency manager that has lock files in it? JavaScript or Ruby or anything like that? Yeah, so this whole idea that we go and record like 50 versions or 100 versions, one for each of our dependencies. Instead of that, we can just say, what's the version of our world? 
at version one, two, three, four, five, this, my fact-based system will always return the same answer. Answer. I don't have to go through and say, well, the version of this was this and this and this, which gives me a few interesting possibilities. I can also say that the version just for one particular family is that. I could have different, different versions uh, for different uh, families. Or I could also have queries that cut across time. So I might have a lock file, but I might also want to make the claim that I don't want any vulnerabilities in my code. So I might say that no matter what, even if it's something that's um, not when I knew about it or when I depended on it, I want to say that I never have a vulnerability in my code. I could put that in my query for my dependencies. So what I'm just trying to show you here is that this is just an idea of how we can use facts in a way to describe a world in which we can get more interesting features out. Um, and this is a way that we can fight complexity in systems. This is a system that uh, would allow us to write different types of queries, uh, would allow us to not, uh, not have to store lots of information in order to record something very simple like what was the time when I actually resolved these. Another example of where I've used fact-based systems is machine learning problems. I spent uh, about five years building a very large uh, software as a service machine, le machine learning system. And the, how we build machine learning systems that we have to describe now and the past. So most supervised machine learning problems are, are work by recording lots of examples. So as with most machine learning, we use the smartest minds in our world to sell ads to people. So if I want to sell an ad to you, I want to know what you did. I want to know that you spent this much money at this time at this shop. I want to know that you click on these things or you like these things. These are your demographics. I want to know the past and I want to know what it is now. So if you change and now all of a sudden you buy this new thing, well, that might indicate that you're going to buy something else. So selling ads is a great place for a fact-based system. So an example. There are often facts that just pop up in our system naturally. So an example is a transaction log. So customer one bought a pen for $5 at this time. This is a fact. This isn't going to change. In three days, it's still going to be true. In three months, it's still going to be true. This pen was still bought for this much at this amount of time. But there's some things in our systems that are often not naturally facts. So location. Customer one is in New York. Customer two is in Singapore. These things might temporarily be true, but they're not always going to be true. But we can turn them into facts. We, we can record when it was true for. So this person was in New York from this time. And then if they move to London, then we can say they moved to London here. Now we can deduce things like how long did they live in New York, when they moved, wh where are they now, where were they when they bought the pen. Uh, we can ask a whole lot more interesting questions. One of the biggest things that I learned when building machine learning systems around a fact-based system was what time meant. And the fact that we might actually understand time very differently depending on the context. In most machine learning systems, we have two time dimensions. What's gone on in the real world and what's gone in our system. The real world is when the facts are valid for. So when was that person really in London? When was that person really in, sister, in Sydney? When did they really buy that pen? We also have when do we learn about that fact? And that's very relevant. So whilst you may have bought the pen on Thursday, I didn't know about it till Saturday. And that's very important because if I want to learn from your behavior and I don't, and it takes me two days to learn when you bought something, I need to understand that. So on the world side, so when we're trying to understand what's really happening, we have two types of time. We have intervals, so periods of time where something is true. So this person lived in New York from, from here to here. So we have kind of a, a range or an interval. We have instants, so things that happened at a specific point in time. This pen was bought at this instant. And then for system time, we have this idea of horizons. When did we learn about it? So we bought the pen on Thursday, but we actually didn't learn about it to Saturday. And so that three-day lag is something that I'll need to take into account. So when I ask the question of, should I give you an advertisement for a pen, I'll have to understand that actually your data that I have is three days out of date and I can do that with this idea of system time or when, to, when I learnt about something. 
And interestingly, we can use different types of timestamps for these. We can use real world time, so 2016 as a specific point in time. We can also use this idea of logical clocks. We can actually replicate time in a far simpler manner by just having an increasing counter. More importantly, most often we just need to know, did something happen before something else? Could something have caused something else? This idea of causal inference. And it's really powerful. And we can simplify a lot of fact-based and time-based systems by using IDs like that. It's present day. So I've talked a lot about the past. I've talked about complexity and how complexity comes into programming. I've talked about how functional programming was born. It was born through this idea of facts and deductive reasoning and AI and how it's gone on and I've used it in many systems. I want to talk about now kind of other places that it's being used or other techniques that we have at our disposal for you to bring this into your current systems. We have all of these types of uh, complexities that we have to deal with, but we can address them through facts. So one of the first things I want to talk about is this idea of how would we implement values in our system or where do values pop up? So I mentioned it quickly before, but this idea of content addressable storage. Content addressable storage is a technique that can be extremely powerful. So who's heard of content, content addressable storage before? A couple of people. So the idea of content addressable storage is that given some file, say an image, we would take its hash, right? And that would give us an ID. We would actually then store that image, say on S3 or some file server, against that hash. So the only thing is there is the hash ID. And the only way to get that image back is to know that hash. So I have to know what that image was originally. Seems a little obtuse, but actually is really powerful. Okay, So uh, it's used in Git quite heavily. It's how Git works. And I'll go and explain that a little bit in a second. Um, but it also provides for really powerful mechanisms like caching. So I know that if you're asking for this hash and you have a file that has that hash, I know that you've already got it. I don't have to send it to you again. So it opens up a whole bunch of possibilities because of this value semantics. Another thing that might be familiar to functional programming is, is this idea of persistent data structures, so purely functional data structures. If you've used Clojure or Scala or Haskell, you may have used persistent data structures even without knowing it. This idea of having data structures where as you update them or as you create new versions of them is that they don't have to copy uh, copy themselves totally. There was a question about performance in the keynote this morning around, well, do we do this efficiently? Well, one of the most efficient ways which functional data structures work is this idea of structural sharing. So when we have version one and we create version two, we don't need to create a whole copy of version two. It's going to largely reference version one just with the differences. So this whole idea of persistent data structures comes up time and time again when we're building fact-based systems. The next part of the equation is how do we store and distribute facts? So one of the most reusable uh, uh, approaches that we have is this idea of append-only logs. It's a very robust and reliable uh, mechanism for storage. We could think of an append-only log as, as fact storage directly. We write one record, then we write another, and we write another. We never go back and update anything. We just keep updating. And these have been used in real database systems for a very long time. Postgres, which is probably one of the best and most reliable relational databases, uses an append-only log for its transactional data log. So if you've used Postgres before, you use something that has an append-only log as its central data structure and borrows a lot of its ideas from functional programming. Then we have the idea of distributed logs. The idea of these append-only logs means that they're easily shareable, addressing our distribution or, or the fact that data is often hard to distribute and share. Uh, we have many protocols like Paxos and Raft for distributing these logs simply between each other in a coordinated way without us having to have any special knowledge of what's in the logs. And so there are many systems built around this idea. So in practice, where would you see these techniques being used? So I've talked about, I've mentioned Git uh, a couple of times, but Git works in very much of a fact-based system way. So Whilst the authors of Git probably didn't think about it like this, it is a good way to go about understanding a system or building a system that might have the same reliability prom promises as what Git has. So in Git, we have blob storage, which is basically the actual contents of the files. 
and it is a content addressable store. They take each of the files that you've edited, they hash them, and they put a file in the object directory against that hash. Okay? So they're just values. Every file that you've ever touched is a value, and they're all treated as peers. There's no, the fact that it's a file that you edited today versus three years ago isn't any different. They're all objects sitting next to each other. Then we have trees, and trees are very much like our persistent data structures. Trees in Git point to these objects, and they give them meaning. So it says that this file, for our head version, this file lives in the file readme.md. And there may be an old version that points to the old readme, but they're just all pointing to the same values and the same objects. So this whole idea of having fixed values and facts that point to those values is pretty powerful. Another place which we'll, you'll see uh, value semantics and uh, fact-based systems is in Kafka. So uh, people heard of Kafka before? Yep, yep. So Kafka's pretty big and it's also pretty hairy and pretty bad to run in real practice, but under, under the covers, it does have some simple ideas. Um, it's not something that I would run to use, but I do think it's something that I would like to steal its ideas of. So Kafka works with a simple append-only log. We have a producer that's continually writing out, and very different to many other queues, rather than somebody taking off that queue and we're mutating it. They just keep writing to that, and they never worry about anything else. Then each consumer maintains a pointer to their append-only log. So if we have two consumers, I get to maintain an independent pointer to you. So I could be pointing at uh, offset 9, and you could be pointing at offset 11. We don't need to coordinate on that. We could have a totally different view of things. And that makes it very easy for Kafka to replicate partitions between machines and do a whole bunch of other interesting large-scale uh, computing problems, or solve a whole bunch of large-scale computing problems. Another place is Datomic. Datomic, uh, actually has a lot of these concepts that I've talked about as first class things. In Datomic, you actually your, data your database is a value and it stores facts about identities. And it lets you replicate very easily this whole idea of a fact-based system. It uses a thing called Datalog, so it's a logic programming language for deducing new facts, so very much like my I'm at, ho I'm at my desk and my desk is at home. So you can use Datomic to deduce new facts like that. Um, you can use, you can query over time. So just like what I showed when I was looking at the dependency management, we might want to query now. So what dependency should I have? But I might want to query over time, which is over all time, do these dependencies have any vulnerabilities? And so Datomic has this flexibility. It lets you query now and into the past and into the future potentially. So just some closing thoughts. This idea isn't meant to be super, this talk isn't meant to be super technical. It's meant to give you a whole bunch of ideas or a whole bunch of ideas that you might go back and apply to your systems in practice. Uh, they all stem from functional programming roots, but they aren't specific to functional programming. If you're writing in Java or you're writing in Scala or you're writing in Haskell, equally we can adopt these larger scale things. And one of the best things that I've used time and time again is this idea of better controlling data using immutable data, using factual data, using data that will always be true. It gives me a lot of options. It gives me a lot of ways to interpret things differently after the, after, uh, into the future. It makes my systems more adaptable and more changeable because I don't have to think about every possible outcome up front. I do really believe that complexity can be managed by treating time and, and order as first class citizens. So trying to find these things in your system is, is a really good idea. I'd like to reiterate that functional programming was designed originally and is still a very good thing for treating time as a first class citizen. Immutability comes naturally. Our data structures have it built in. And there are a whole bunch of techniques and a whole bunch of being tools that are slowly being built out with these techniques and often more slowly than they need to be because they don't understand the fundamentals. And if you can go back to your systems and find a place where maybe you don't have to update, or maybe when you're designing a database schema, you could think about facts rather than mutation, it might give you a few more possibilities. So I hope that it's given you some ideas. I hope that some of it's useful. Um, I, I wish that I had known some of these things or known about some of these papers and some of these things 10 years ago. And 
I would, I would have really appreciated hearing about some of it. So I hope that it's valuable for you. So thank you. Cool. Any questions? Yep. So there is a uh, there is some urgency of a value you have to deliver. Yep. And uh, the ease with which you can deliver value using a mutable, let's say, data store, yep. is much more as compared to the current solutions out there, which have these fact-based data storage. Mm -hmm. uh, to give a specific example, uh, just like uh, I may have a stream of facts, and using them, I can deduce uh, where someone is staying uh, right now. Just yep. taking that example, yep. uh, uh, but in practice, given the current popular solutions out there, that will be way more difficult. Now, Git has solved that problem. Uh, Git has solved both those problems in the uh, code change management world. But yep. in data storage world, uh, I think there is still a huge gap, which yep. leads to you choosing between what is easy right now and what is easy to manage in the long haul. Yeah, that's true from a tooling perspective. In that there isn't any. I don't think that there are any very magical great tools to do it but i think if you understand the techniques you can apply a lot of them to your databases as they are so an example that i've got uh, from a recent project i've worked on is uh, we had some audit requirements so it's pretty common in business apps is that you have to be have auditability so rather than having an extra table that um, you had to keep up to date and was going to be error prone where people were writing into it and stuff we were just using postgres so no special tools um, we constructed a, a situation where Actually, we wrote out every, it was a user audit table. So every time somebody changed a user, we wrote out a new fact which described that user. And then we had another table which is just pointing to the current set of users. Um, so very much like the blob and tree in Git. And it was just two tables. Um, there was no complicated SQL. Um, and it worked out really well. So whilst I agree that there are no really great tools for doing it, I think some of the techniques that these tools use, if you understand them, you can apply in the current tools, if that makes sense. Uh, my question is, uh, sometimes uh, all the facts are not uh, captured. For example, uh, X works on, say, Windows at one point of time. Yep. Uh, but in future, the same X won't work on the same uh, Windows uh, due to we have missed some facts, like something has been extra installed or something has been there more. In this case, uh, how to handle? Um, yeah, it is a tough one. So. That there's no easy way. So sometimes you can reinterpret back. So uh, in this, the machine learning system that I spent a lot of time building, uh, we dealt with like insurance companies and banks who just did all sorts of things with their data and often had no idea what the actual facts were. Um, so by taking backups and doing differences and stuff, we were able to reconstitute some facts, but it wasn't very fun. <laughs> um, but I guess. There's no, once you've lost data, you've lost it, um, and maybe you can't go back, but uh, I think that trying to make some sensible decisions now to minimize the amount of data you lose through updates and things like that can help. Uh, I don't think there's any magic solution, but just trying to minimize loss uh, from now on is, is helpful. I am Asan. Uh, what dependency management tool did you build? Like for what language did you build? Uh, it was language agnostic, um, but it's not public, regrettably. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it worked for Scala and Haskell and JavaScript um, because of the company I worked at, but it's not public. Yeah. Uh, it looked like a nice DSL for uh, dependency management. Yeah, yeah. It was something new. Like uh, I've used some dependency management tools, and it was a bit different. Like, yep. th that's yeah, that's nice. It's something that I would like to be public. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, thank you for the talk. No, so that you, you have used this statement called uh, functional programming specializes in treating time as a first class entity. Yep. And the reason for that from what I understand from the talk is the functional language provides the, the immutable data structures. Is it the only reason or could you put you know extra three or four sentences to you know to arrive at that conclusion? I think that that um, my modern take on it is largely about immutable data or about uh, data first class data that you can reinterpret. Um, I think traditionally it wasn't just that. So when Lisp was first created, it was also just about expressibility. So it, uh, writing a program that even if you had all of those facts, writing a program in the languages of 1959 would have been extremely expensive. So if I wanted to go and create a new program that understood those facts in a different way, it was an expensive endeavor. So functional programming also was an express, uh, a boost in express t uh, in how you could express the program. Um, so that helped a lot, but that's probably less true nowadays in that most program programming languages would be more than sufficient for it. Cool, thanks very much.